God corrected me on something this week. Um, it, it's not a big thing. It's it's not like I'm going to tell you some sin or something. So don't get excited about it. Uh, but uh, he corrected me on um, me thinking that I knew something that I really don't know and pretending. Uh, as we've been going through this series, I've, I've told you um, over and over that there are three primary metaphors in the Bible for the church, and that's the family and the body and the temple. Well, on Monday, it started kind of rattling around in my head that I might have missed one. And like, you know, I just didn't pull those out of a book someplace or it wasn't some blog post, you know. I, I came up with those three myself. I mean, this is just... And, and God was like saying, you know, there's another one that you forgot. And uh, it was the, you know, my church is being a building. Oh, well, that's, that's no big deal. You know, they don't listen anyway. Nobody's going to notice whether I said, you know, maybe... maybe this week, you could just kind of start off by saying, now, as I've been telling you, there are four primary metaphors <laughs> for the church and the Bible, and then that's, you know, <clears throat> God as a family, and God as a body, and God as a temple, and God as a building. And, uh, and then I went to Bible study on Wednesday night and watched the video, and the video, those of you that are in that study or were in it this morning, notice that it starts off with N.T. Wright, and he shows this huge cathedral and he has this illustration that he uses about that a cathedral of course this you know massive church building and it's all made out of stone and the cathedrals always have a stone mason because they're constantly repairing some of the walls so they have to have a stone mason that's on the staff that's always chiseling stone out and you know he was using the church to represent this body uh, or excuse me, this, this building, and that each one of us is like a stone that's fitted in and we're part of that building. And so um, God was, I think, kind of saying to me, well, you can't cover this one up. And then as I went on on Thursday to write this sermon, I thought, man, I just got to include this because this is something that we can't leave. This is really important. And I, And, you know, Maybe maybe someone here today, I, my guess would be, is that somebody here today really needs to see this, and this is going to be important to you. So I want to back up a little bit. I want to bring in a different way to see the church. The church is a building composed of stones that are fit together, and the church is a building. is just this major metaphor, really, in Scripture. I don't know how I missed it, but I, you know, just not that thorough of a guy. And it's used by Jesus. It's used by uh, Paul, it's used by Peter, and remember Jesus said, uh, he said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And, you know, that's because Jesus was contrary to, to what the movies depict. Jesus, as they say, he was a carpenter, the son of Joseph, but Carpenter in their day did not mean a man that makes furniture. We, we see him in the movies, and he's you know he's he's sanding the leg of the table, or you know, and it's he's like out in the garage, and he's got his plane, and he's this master carpenter making fine furniture, and that's not probably accurate at all. Uh, the Greek word that was used for carpenter um, really means builder. It's tekton, and tekton was used for someone that was a construction worker. And it meant that you were skilled in uh, handling stone, which was their primary building material at the time. And you could also do wood, too. And it says Jesus was a tectone. He was in his day, um, I mean, and this is my kind of change the way that you see Jesus. Uh, um, Jesus was a builder, probably wore Carhartts, uh, I'm sure and had a tool belt, you know, with a hammer hanging there. Before he, he went into ministry, he took off his car hearts and he put on that white robe that we, we see so much. Then probably sarcasm overload there, but um, that's who he was. And so for him to say, for he to say that uh, 
that this is the church is it was like a building, just fits with his vocation so well because he had put the stones together. He had built things and he knew what that was so it would be working for us. And this image of the building with each stone carefully placed together, each stone sharing the weight, uh, each stone, uh, you know, absolutely important for the integrity of the build, building is what God's vision of the church is. And among all other things that we do here at the gathering, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to reinstate the idea that the church is a good thing. Because in our culture today, people, many people don't see the church as a good thing. So it's really important that we understand what that is and we live that and we, we're, we're pushing against that negative image of the church. And of course, we remember that uh, Jesus was seen as the cornerstone. And uh, when you begin a stone building, the first thing that you do is you set the cornerstone. The cornerstone determines the direction of the building. If it's off just a little bit, the whole building's going to be off. If it's not completely level, then the building's not going to be level. So the cornerstone, everything comes from it. And it says that Jesus was the cornerstone. And of course, it also says that he was the cornerstone that the builders rejected meaning that the building that God was building with the church would be rejected by some people in the world, that they're going to look at, at Jesus and they're going to look at, at the building that's resulted from he being the cornerstone and they're going to say, it, it just looks too weak, he's just not the right one. Uh, he, he, who would build a building around this guy? You know, They're not going to accept who he is. But God says, I'm going to do a new thing and I'm going to build this building of, of people who are dedicated to Jesus Christ and against that building, the gates of Hades are not going to prevail. You know, this is going to be a really strong building. And he points exactly in the right direction. He's perfectly level. He can bear the weight. And the other stones, we all rest upon him. And he, he looks like the kind of building into which other stones would want to be placed. So that's from Jesus. Secondly, from, from Paul to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, and whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, if you're real quick, you can spot three of our four metaphors in that passage. I couldn't weasel four in there. But you can see God's household, the family of God. You can see the whole building metaphor, the foundation, and uh, being fitted together, the whole building. And then look right there, it says... A holy temple. So we got three of the four. I think that's pretty good, you know, that uh, we've got all those there. But the church is being fitted together in each one of the stones, and that means that each stone is important, and together we make up the building. But of course, on our own, we're just one rock. We're just a stone, and we're just not enough. Now, what does that have to do with the subject today of encourage one another? Well, uh, we've been going through these one and others, and uh, we're learning what it means to be a part of the family, part of the body, part of the temple, part of the building, and we're seeing how the way that we love each other is so important because when the church really loves each other and the people do these one and others, then it's evident to the world and they see that Jesus is alive in us. And today, we come to this one, encourage one another, and it sounds pretty easy, really. I mean, this, this one sounds easier than the rest of them. Next week, we've got forgive one another. That sounds like the hardest one. But this is just encourage one another. And this concept of members being the church and fitted together into a building, dependent on one another, has everything to do with our ability to encourage one another. Now, just a few more examples from the Word. Uh, Ephesians 3.13 it says, encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Encouragement was extremely necessary in the early church because they were under a lot of stress, almost continually. God was establishing this new world and, and this new community, and then the world didn't think much of that. 
okay, of, of who these people were. So Christians often needed encouragement. And here it says day by day, not occasionally, but daily, not just every Sunday, just encourage each other during the meet and greet on Sunday. No, it says daily, day by day, encourage we, each other. And it's, it's amazing, you know, how much can, can happen just in one week, just in a few days from, from one Sunday to the next Sunday. There's so many things that can happen to us and can change our lives. And if we're just a Sunday-only church, just going from week to week, there, there's a lot that's left out. There, there's a lot of time in there. I mean, all it takes is just one phone call, uh, you know, one certified letter, uh, one call into the boss's office. And so, so we're told to encourage each other every day, not just on Sundays. And the reason it says for encouragement is to keep us from becoming hardened by sin. Now, what that means is that we are to encourage each other because we're living in a world that there's a lot of bad things that goes goes on and if it's not done daily if the encouragement is not done daily we can begin to think that the world is normal and and the sin of the world is normal and we we begin to to move our attitudes down our expectations down of what life is and so it complies with what's going on in this world And so he says, encourage each other daily so this world doesn't harden you. So you don't say, oh, it's never going to get any better. Things are rotten or it's going to stay rotten. And that's the point of encouragement. John 16, 33, from Jesus when he was still up there in the upper room on the net last night, he said, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, difficulties, but take courage I have overcome the world. Jesus says, have courage. Uh, Be encouraged because I've overcome this world. You see, if you're living in me, you can rest assured that my kingdom's going to win. That's the end of the story. So the ministry and the practice of encourage one another is vital. It's it's not not something that just sounds good and being nice to other people. He says, I'm... Now, I'm not going to say that our, our age is any worse than any other age. We don't know. We didn't live in those, those generations. We don't know, know what it was like. But, but certainly today, as Christians, we do need to, to be encouraged. And then Paul, he spent a lot of time encouraging the churches. You know, he had four missionary journeys. He went out over a 20-year period four times. And the first time he established churches, he established some churches almost every time he went out. But three, uh, but two, three, four were primarily going back to the churches where he had been and encouraging them. So he would start a church. He would leave them with some leadership, spend some time there. And then when he, he would come back in a couple, three years just to, to build them up because they were starting to leak. You see, they, it, was, it was a rough time. He needed to encourage him. So, so we have this Acts 14, 21 through 22 passage. It says, after they had preached the gospel to that city, he's talking about Paul, and had made many disciples, they returned to, to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, three churches he had started before, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Hear the, hear the echo there of what Jesus said to him. Same kind of message. On other occasions, he sent some of his protégés like uh, Timothy and Tychicus. He he would say, you know, I'm to the churches of Colossae, I'm going to send Tychicus to you to encourage you. And he'd send out an emissary like that. Now, the, the word encourage is used many times in the New Testament. It's vital to the practice of the church. And one thing I like about the whole concept of encouragement in the word is it's easy to understand. Sometimes the, you know, getting from the Greek to the English is it's kind of a difficult concept. This one's really easy. Nobody's going to miss this one. Encouragement means that we give another person hope and confidence and courage. And and the prefix there in the English word encourage en means into and then we've got courage. 
So someone else is moving you into courage. Okay, so, so you're facing something and there's some stress. And someone else comes to encourage you. They're moving you into courage. And I, I, th- I think back on my life and gosh, you know, I, I kind of did this in my notes of just jotting some names down. I'm not going to tell you the people, but I came up with a long list of people that some of them I knew pretty well. Some of them I didn't know that well who came into my life just maybe for a day and encouraged me. And it was, it was a time when there was some stress. And, you know, I didn't call them up and say, could you come by? They just kind of like God just sent them and they showed up. They were, you know, it's just wonderful. But just come by and spend some time with old Don. And, you know, maybe they didn't tell me anything that was really profound. But when it was over, I just felt better. I just had some courage. We're, we're finding, you know, that whether we experience emotional hurts or physical hurts are about the same thing. Um, you know, sometimes through, through the actions of others, they, they harm us, they reject us. There's pain in our lives. And we say things like, well, she broke my heart or uh, he, he hurt my feelings. Um, or we say man is, is a real punch in the gut. And, and we, we use those those words, those phrases to mean an emotional thing happened to us, and yet we use the same kind of phrase we'd use if we were physically hurt. And a guy named, a neuroscientist named Matthew Lieberman, he thought this was just a little bit too coincidental, so he set up a study to plan social rejection. And one of his studies involved putting people in a brain scanner uh, while they played an internet video game called Cyberball. I don't know if anybody's ever played. I've not played Cyberball, but it's probably being Googled right now. I'm going to say this. But anyway, in, in the video game, it's an internet video game called Cyberball, and the, the subject, the person, plays against two imaginary computer people, and they just simply toss a ball around. And so it's my turn. I throw it to you. He throws it to him. He throws it back to you. But, you know, everything's fine. Got this brain scanner on so the, so the neuroscientists can look at what's going on in the brain. A strange thing happened is after so long in Cyberball, the two computer uh, persons stop playing with the real person. They just throw the ball back and forth. You know, it's just like keep away, what it turns into. And so um, even though it's just a silly game in the research study and has no um, bearing in life, the research subjects were really hurt. And they started feeling distress, and they felt rejected. And when they came out of the scanner, they kept talking to the researchers about how upset they were, how unfair this game was, that the two computer people stopped playing ball with them. And the most interesting part of the study is how their brains process this. The brain, uh, social pain feels like physical pain, and a broken heart can feel like a broken leg. And as Lieberman puts it, he he writes, he says, looking at the brain scan side by side without knowing which one was an analysis of physical pain and which was an analysis of social pain, you wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. In other words, when human beings experience threats or damage to their social bonds, the brain responds in much the same way as it responds to physical pain. So when we get rejected, when somebody hurts our feelings, it really hurts. Isn't that strange? So it's funny how we probably always knew this. It just took some neuroscientists and probably half a million dollars to, to figure this out. And, and somebody's spending the whole afternoon inside of one of those brain scanners. No one's immune from pain and emotional pain hurts. And when we get hurt, we often do some stupid things. If you're like me, if you get rejected, what follows usually is anger. And if you don't handle the anger, if you don't get rid of the anger, what happens is resentment. And you start doing some stupid things in life unless you can break that cycle. But God says, encourage one another. You're, you're in the church. Encourage one another. Be close enough to one another so that you can feel another person's pain And then give them some of your hope, some of your encouragement. And so the other person does not become hardened by the world. A few weeks ago, I went to our denomination's uh, annual or biannual assembly. 
down at Hoptown, as they call it. Now that I've been there, I can call it that, Hopkinsville, for you non-knowing people. I don't like to go to those things. Uh, I, I, there's, there's a lot of reasons why I don't like to go to them, but I, I'm not going to tell you why. But um, there was one reason that I wanted to go, and it was because I'd made arrangements with three other pastors I said, hey, while we're there, let's get together. Let's sit down and talk. And so one of the guys drove six hours to get there, and he came in. Man, you could see it on his face. He was beat up. He says, I'm so tired, not just from the drive. But he said, the only reason I came was because of you guys, because we were going to meet. And so we had about an hour and a half to two hours to just sit together and and talk, and we're like-minded uh, pastors and um, the word was used over and over again as the, the time passed. And we, we, the word that was used was encouraged. I feel encouraged. We didn't give each other advice. Um, we just, you know, said, how you doing, man? What's going on? Just sat there and listened to each other. Just kind of enjoyed a couple of hours of time together. No one had a prophetic word from God for another person. Um, we found... Has Jesus said that where two or more are together in his name, that he's there? But the sky didn't open up. We didn't hear any voices. And yet we left there and said, wow, we need to do that again. We need to do that on a regular basis just, just to listen. Now, you know, I could talk some more about encourage, how to encourage each other and how to do it. But I don't, I don't really think it's a skill. Um, it, it might be a gift. I, I don't know. I I don't think there's a whole lot of how-tos on this. I think this is pretty simple. I think it's just more of a part of just being a part of God's building. Just realizing I'm a stone. I fit in here. And we could talk about how somebody gives encouragement and someone receives it because, you know, it's not only that someone is going to be there to give it, but someone has to be willing to receive the encouragement. Sometimes we can just um, be so isolated and like our isolation that we can cut other people out. But I want to just one more, make one more point here. And the point, uh, the reason I'm going to just make one point is with the hopes that you'll remember one thing instead of trying to remember three or four today. Okay? And my point is, is that encouragement means is that I'm not alone. That's simple. I'm not alone. I mean, to encourage someone is more than anything else just being with them. You just got to be with them. You, you can't, there's no other way to do this. So it's so simple and so profound that someone else is with me. Someone else knows. I, I'm not alone. There, there's no need for teaching. There's, there's no need for pep talks. That's not what this means. It doesn't mean you got to get around them and cheer them up and, you know, change the whole direction of the day. The ministry of encouragement comes through the presence of another who cares. And, and when we're alone, and we think we're alone, boy, hope and courage, they're rare. Now, we might wonder why God made us that way. Why, why didn't God make us so we could be just rugged individualists and not need another person? And why, why can't we just do it all by ourselves? And I, I think that God has done this because he he wants to just continually show us that it's not me but it's we it's always it's not about me but it's always about we me is never enough can you remember that me is never now that's exactly opposite of what the world's going to tell you you can do it all on your own you've got everything you need you don't need anybody go out there and get them you know it's not gonna work me is never enough I can't be the family by myself, can I? No. I can't be the body by myself. I, I can't be the temple by myself. I surely can't be the building by myself. It's not about me. It's always about we. And God looks at us and I think he says, you know, she's going to make a good stone in my building. I, I, I got to rub a little bit off here. I got to sand this down. You know, she's a little bit out of kilter there in a few places, but I'm going to work on her. It's, it, it might hurt a little bit, you know. There, there might be a little bit of pressure here as I, I chip away a few things, at places she's got sticking out that aren't quite going to fit in good. But what he sees in us when he sees us 
is an important part of his building, each and every one of us. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Notice it says with. <laughs> it doesn't say, uh, you know, rejoice about those who rejoice or rejoice for those who rejoice or weep about those who weep or weep for those who weep. It says weep with those who weep. And the necessity is that to encourage and to be encouraged, you have to be present. You, you just There's no other way to do it. To give some of our faith away, some of our courage away, you have to go there. You have to stay there. My dad died when suddenly when he was 59, and um, entire uh, small farming community. Uh, I wasn't living there at the time. I moved back shortly afterwards, but it was just shock. I mean, everybody was was really uh, shocked. My mom was practically hysterical. And um, what happened was not, after, after that, was not unusual at all in that, in that community. Some ladies from church uh, showed up at the house. They were ladies that my mom had grown up with. Uh, she'd gone to high school with them, and they in the same church, known them their whole lives. And they showed up with some food, and they didn't go home. They stayed. Okay. They just didn't drop something off. Some people did. That's fine. But there was a group of ladies who showed up at our home, and they cleaned the house because my mom wasn't expecting this kind of trauma. They did the laundry. They cooked the meals. They received people at the door. They sat with my mom. And they sat with all of us, and they didn't go home. And that wasn't because we were such a great family. That's just what people did. It's just what you did. You had friends. They, they came, they sat with you, and they were with you. And there was always somebody there all the way through the funeral for a couple days. And I, I look back now and I realize their ministry was one of encouragement. They were giving us some of their hope. They were giving us some of their courage. They, they had enough for us. And so they were giving some of it to us. And there's a powerful ministry in doing little more than just sitting with someone, just saying with your presence that, hey, you're not alone. I got your back, as we'd say. We will go through this. Not you, but we will go through this. And God has sent me to be with you. I don't know. Maybe today uh, some of you feel that way, uh, that you need to be encouraged. And if you are, if you're in that, that place today where you say, gosh, it's been rough, then I, I just want to encourage you. I want you to know you're in the right place. There's, there's enough room, there's, excuse me, there's enough love in this room for everybody. There's no shortage. We got enough for you. So if you're, if you're here today and you're going, man, I don't know if I can make it another week. I, I don't know, you know, I don't see any way out of this. Um, maybe you just need to be in the body in the family, in the temple, in the building. You need to put your, your stone in the wall, so to speak. Or maybe, maybe you uh, don't need to be encouraged today and you're doing really well, and um, then I would say to you that, well, God has given you enough courage for yourself and hope today, and get around somebody else and... Just kind of let that osmosis work so they get some of it today. All right, you're in the right place. But I want you to remember, this is the image I want you to take home, that you're part of that wall, that you're one of the stones, and that you're fit into that wall. Let's pray. Dip your heart in 
As deep cries out. 